My guest today is Aki Jain, the Chief Technology Officer and President of U.S. Government for Palantir. Aki, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks for having me. Let me set just a little bit of context for our discussion. Only today are agencies starting to realize the power and potential of true artificial intelligence. Over the past few years, the, de the Defense Department specifically has invested a great deal of time, money, and effort to lay the foundation to make better use of its data through tools and capabilities that rely on artificial intelligence. Starting in 2017, DOD saw the handwriting on the wall as near-peer competitors like China and Russia accelerated their efforts to apply AI to weapons and systems. The Congressional Research Office in a November 2020 report said that DOD must work through distinct challenges to further take advantage of AI's real and potential benefits to military operations. Among the questions the CRS posed include, what type of military AI applications are possible and what limits, if any, should be imposed? What unique advantages and vulnerabilities come with employing AI for defense? And how will AI change warfare and what influence will it have on the military balance with US competitors? Well, to help answer those questions and many others, let's turn to Aki Jain, the Chief Technology Officer and President of US government with Palantir. Instead of trying to answer all those questions right away, let's just start mm -hmm. at the beginning. A lot of people define AI differently. In the CRS report, they had definitions going back to 90, 1993, 1992, robots and, yeah. you know, uh, you know, the Terminator movies, right? But I think we have a better definition, a better sense of really what AI means. So let's start with that initial definition. How, how does Palantir and others start to define it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think at Palantir, we really think about AI as ultimately a means to an end. So the interesting question for us is what outcomes is that commander or that warfighter or that user in the DOD really trying to achieve with AI, and as opposed to getting tied up with, you know, how do I define AI or AGI or something like that, uh, what is the thing I'm trying to achieve? And I think we, we really see in this moment there's kind of um, two things that the department is demanding, right? The first is um, decision decision space or decision advantage, right? Uh, we have so much data that's available to us and only more data coming online, it's impossible for a human to sift through all that. So how do I ultimately enable uh, my warfighter, my analyst, my operator to leverage that data um, in order to have some kind of decision advantage? That's kind of the first thing that's really the use case that we're seeing for AI given the deluge. The second one is really thinking of AI as a teammate. Right, uh, just like you have uh, other folks that you work with uh, on a on a team to achieve some kind of outcome, how do I ultimately enable AI to be more seamless, to be a trusted teammate in solving a problem with me? Right. Sometimes that's dealing with the deluge of data. Sometimes it's just helping me look at new perspectives uh, uh, with that data that might you know suggest a particular course of action. So I think those are really the two specific use cases, you know, kind of at a high level. Uh, and then there's a hundred different uh, work streams that one might pursue within those use cases that we think are the key problems problems to apply AI to today. Do you get a sense that we're talking about true AI, which again, we're not really sure. defining what that is, but, but versus predictive analytics, yeah. versus machine learning, versus something else that just has that title of AI? At this point, really what folks are generally applying is machine learning and, and honestly techniques that are you know, decades old at this point, but now that you have uh, pervasive commercial compute available, we have, again, more data than we've ever had prior, and we have um, kind of the, the, the data science and the computer science has gotten to the point where for certain domains, computer vision being one of the most common ones folks talk about, uh, you can use some of those machine learning techniques to actually effectively pattern match and do certain types of predictive work uh, on top of those data sets in ways that enable uh, the warfighter and the operator. So really, that's, that's kind of what we're seeing the most. Um, the other area that I think we're seeing uh, some really cool innovation uh, is in the robotic process automation space. You know, UiPath is doing a great job there, uh, really helping kind of those folks whose, whose eyes are bleeding processing paper forms that are filled out by soldiers around the department, um, helping them automate and enhance and actually ultimately better serve those soldiers in the business processes uh, uh, that we've seen. So I think RPA is kind of another area where we're seeing um, some really good use cases and outcomes. I love the fact you make that connection back to RPA because a lot of people say, oh, RPA, it's dumb AI, right? That's not yeah. smart AI. It's not the future of AI. Yeah. But the impact RPA is having, there's actually just a new report out from the uh, community of interest for RPA about mm -hmm. the state of RPA in government. And, and the state is strong, so without a doubt. Well, Everyone's using it. You know, and to your point, actually, I, I, we should also be, you know, we, this is why I kind of think of AI is it's one of the arrows in our quiver, right? And it's really easy to go around and say, let's use AI and everything. Uh, for a lot of the problems that the department is actually facing, especially in, in kind of the sensing world, AI isn't actually the best technology to apply. Uh, traditional algorithmic approaches, like 
you know, there's probably an engineer at, um, at your favorite large SI that's been studying a radar system for the last 25 years. Yeah. I'm gonna bet on that human and their ability to write an algorithm, a basic algorithm, any day over a particular machine learning or, or other approach to, to one of those problems. Um, uh, and so, you know, you just gotta find the right place to apply it. And I think that gets back to the data piece that you mentioned. There's kind of two ways agencies or DODs using it. One is focused on how to make the data more valuable. The second is the, as the teammate. So let's maybe go down that path of data. Palantir is known for mm -hmm. big data, being a big data organization. Uh, what is the challenge of applying AI to data? <clears throat> how to get the, your data ready, the structured versus unstructured discussion, let's walk yeah. down that path. Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, I, I think ultimately, you know, for the last 17 years, uh, you know, Palantir has really been kind of, uh, uh, kind of screaming from the top of the mountains, like it's all about the data, right? Um, uh, you know, ultimately if we can get on top of our data, whether, you know, our initial mission was making that data kind of break down data silos, uh, but then securely enabling intelligence analysts to make sense of the data while protecting privacy and civil liberties, right? Uh, and so if you really think about it, it's always been about the data for us. And the analytic component on top of that kind of critical data organization, data management, data security, uh, and, and auditability uh, has always been what we thought about. Uh, in fact, we were quite skeptical of AI for a long time. Um, so in the last few years, really, you know, I think because you've seen a convergence now, we've got cloud computing, we've got pervasive GPU uh, access. We have a set, of, um, a set of problems, frankly, that are well oriented for using AI and machine learning techniques. Um, you know, that's kind of where we really dove in and tried to enable them. But the core of what we really believe is that uh, whether it's a, uh, a human, another machine, or an algorithm, um, what you're trying to ultimately do is enable some kind of collaboration across all those parties to enable them to make a better combined decision to drive some kind of outcome. So everything we do is about in an operational context, again, whether you're on the Intel community side or the defense side, but in an operational context, how am I leveraging every piece of data that I can possibly get access to, subject to security, in order to make the best possible decision in that moment? And what DOD is looking at this, and not just DOD, but really all agencies, is how to get faster at that decision making, and yeah. how can tools like AI and others really get you to that point? Are you starting to see it happening today? As, as when we may get to some of the use cases, and and yeah. we may get to the more anecdotes later. But but it is where where is DoD specifically on that kind of spectrum of hey, are we driving faster decisions? Absolutely. I, I think if you look at some of the work that's been happening through the Global Information Dominance Experiment, uh, some of the work you look at with Scarlet Dragon, uh, the work that's coming out of a number of different exercises around the department. Uh, and then you kind of level set that all with the DEPSECDEF's DOD data decrees, um, the work that's going into the new CDAO role and kind of shaping that, kind of the work that you know uh, Dave Spurke and the CDO's office have done uh, along with many others. Uh, you're seeing actually one, uh, I think the department is starting to really come to terms with and get a grip on their data. Two, uh, they're figuring out how to govern it and how to prevent kind of more stovepipes from from uh, uh, being created. Um, so you know, if you're gonna do something new, you, you gotta bring it to the consensus three. They're applying it not just in the warfighting and operational domain, but they're actually applying it in their business systems, right? Um, and they're using it to ultimately drive better decisions. Uh, if you take a program like Army Vantage, um, they put out a press release um, about some of the work they've done in kind of the ELO space or unliquidated obligations. This is a set of you know, Army finance experts, so it's not necessarily third-party contractors or Palantir people, but Army um, finance experts who were finally able, I mean, they're saving the Army on the order of a billion dollars a year by their own estimation, based on analysis they were finally able to do because they could get access to data and get the right <laughs> analytic tools and capabilities on top of it to make sense of it. And that's, I think you see there's a there's hundred other examples of that across the department uh, that are really encouraging. You mentioned Scarlet Dragon. That was a show we did on this show, and the mm -hmm. interview I did on this show. So, if folks want to find that, they can obviously. I'll do a self plug here. Find it on federalnewsnetwork.com <laughs> backslash Palantir. You'll hear that again later on. Yeah. But I think that's a really interesting interview, and I think there's a lot going on within the Army about that specifically. When we talk about the other point you're talking about, was making AI a teammate, a partner, and again, I think that gets into not just the data side, but mm -hmm. understanding the use case. How do, how can I apply it, and what benefits should I expect, or what outcome am I trying to achieve? I think a lot of times, what happens in not just government, but I think the private sector too, is they get excited about a, a new technology, the shiny yeah. object syndrome. We hear that all the time. Do you think that DoD is starting to kind of 
get a better sense of, okay, what am I really trying to achieve and where can I plug that AI algorithm in or, or that other technology in? Yeah, I think we're seeing a, an absolute shift there. I, I kind of think about it, uh, if you look at it as akin to like the adoption of cloud computing, right? Um, so I, I think probably, you know, for the first couple of years of, of the cloud being available uh, and then, you know, classified environments starting to come online, um, there was kind of a, a lot of money spent in a lot of little pockets to just experiment, to get uh, the skill set of our IT folks, of our operators, of our analysts up to snuff with what that technology was. Um, and there was almost kind of like, you know, I think about it as like the zero to one phase of adopting the cloud. Um, you kind of have to let, you have to let, because uh, there's an organizational behavior change that you're really desiring here or looking for, you have to let people kind of soak in the thing and figure it out, figure out where it works, where it doesn't work, and, and kind of find a couple of things that really come out of that uh, in order to then figure out what the longer term strategy of the department should be on it and how they should adopt it. And we see that with JWCC coming, you know, kind of there's a path there that makes, I think makes sense. Um, the, 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 when I think about kind of the AI journey, I think really um, it's, folks have been working on it for a while and there's a lot of experiments and a lot of pockets of the department uh, that have clearly, um, <coughs> I think, borne some fruit. Um, not all of them have been super successful, but when you look at things like RPA or you look at some of the CV algorithms, some of the things that Colonel Callahan talked about with respect to Scarlet Dragon, um, there are clearly some use cases that really work and, and can be applied operationally today. Uh, when you hear what General Van Herc is talking about with what they're doing on Decision Advantage and how they're leveraging AI in that, you can see that there's some stuff that really works. And so um, I think that what we're really seeing and what we're finding is that like we've come through to zero to one. And folks kind of have a couple of use cases, uh, at least, that they can see where AI as a teammate um, can be really valuable. And then I think they found a set of other problems that are going to require a longer tail of work. And don't get me wrong, that's not work we should put off into the future. You have to start now, right? Uh, the thing about AI is that, you know, you can't, there's no cheat code. You can't, uh, you don't get to like skip a bunch of steps, like, you know, like cram for the exam and, and kind of deliver. Um, you actually have to start now and leverage the operational data. I mean, that's, that's what we are excellent at as, as a country in order to start to inform those long-term three to five year bets. And we see that from AFC and others that are doing really great work there. Uh, and so it, it's just kind of a long way of saying, I think folks have figured out what kind of works and we can apply now. How are we going to fight tonight? And I, I think we're starting to see adoption of that through things like the DepSec Defs Ada Initiative, for example. And then I think folks have kind of put a few other problems into categories that are going to take a lot longer, right? So, uh, so, so I think that some of those problems are really hard and they're going to take a really long time. And I think AFC is putting points into uh, actually figuring some of those things out through Project Convergence and a few other things. And so that's really exciting. But I think people have kind of stratified what's long term, what's near term, what are we going to use today? And there's that pressure coming from the near peer competitors, of course, so yeah. as I talked about at the beginning, what the Congressional Research Service found with China and Russia really kind of pressing on the US. Uh, I think that's the other piece that's happening is, is there's that outward pressure that, you know, there's always external to, to shiny object, but then that outward pressure yeah. going, you got to move faster. So I think that's also driving some of those timelines. You know, can we stay ahead of or at least be equal to Yep. those others, and I think you probably hear that a, a fair amount. A fair amount, I, and I think ultimately, you know, I think this is why I kind of break it into the, what would I use if I had a fight tonight, versus what would I, what do I hope to have in three years to have some kind of, um, some kind of broader advantage, obviously, in that, in any, any uh, either deterrence or, or potentially defeat mission. Right. On that note, let's take a quick break. We can come back, we can talk about what some of those challenges that duty is facing today and in the future. You're listening to the discussion at Technology and Great Power Competition, AI, Complexity and Competition, sponsored by Palantir on Federal News Network.